Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Tuesday, October the 30th, 2018. 8 a.m. New York time, your first daily dose of happy for the day. We hope your day's off to a great start, whether you're uh, in New York or L.A. or London or Adelaide or wherever you are around the world. We hope your day's off to or even in the middle of a great day because that's how we get into the happy place when we think of it as being a great day. And it is a great yeah. day, right? <laughs> yeah, I love that you said Adelaide. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know, I had to, you know, I, I can't leave everybody out. I have to include, you know, I should, I should probably say Toronto or Montreal and I should probably say, uh, I don't know, um, Pretoria and, uh, you know, Paris, right. Paris. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, I laugh about that because, um, well, first of all, because this morning when I woke up, I, I opened my phone and I had a, a push and it was a comment on something I'd written yesterday and it was from somebody at down under. So to mm, speak. okay. And I, and I thought, oh, because, you know, it came in in the middle of the night. But, of course, it's because it's not the middle of the night there. Right. And then yeah. the other reason is because Adelaide is my mother's name. <laughs> is it? Oh, how nice. That was nice to hear it. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I woke up to, you know, um, I feel like it's important to mention this only because every, I was I was laying in bed and having trouble sleeping. So I was doing a little bit of reading and I was thinking about how we always start out with a daily dose of happy Mm -hmm. and which is excellent. And I happened upon an article about, um, Pharrell Williams song, happy, Mm. which I love. Um, and it was actually letters from his attorneys who had been sent to the Trump campaign because they used his song in their rally the day of the massacre in Pittsburgh. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, oh, and, you know, I've seen lots of these letters going out um, for copyright purposes because their songs are being used and they don't want their songs used to represent any political position. Right. It's not just. I don't think it's just that it's about Trump. It might be, but it's like, I don't want somebody to take my song and act like it's an endorsement for some position that I'm not aware of. So Mm -hmm. I get that. But I thought that this, this particular statement was really sensitive and classy to say, this is not a time to be happy. Uh, What happened today is a a tragedy. And so it it just made me think, because I thought we always start the day with a daily dose of happy. And I think that's important. And I also think that if you're mourning and grieving and feeling sad right now because of the things that have happened, that that's okay. And not that I want to start the podcast off on a downer note, but there is a time (laughs) for everything, right? There's a time to recognize that you feel sad. And if you do, it's okay. Um, I've had a really rough time dealing with the events of the last week. And it's just part of who we are as humans to feel empathy and compassion and sadness when we experience a terrible loss. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. I thought that was important to address. It was for me anyway. It might not be for someone else, but for me, it's important that I let, you know, my people know that, um, that I am not insensitive to the grief and the mourning that's going on in the country and that, yes, I want to do everything I can to bring some cheer and happiness uh, to whoever comes in contact with me or hears my voice. And also that it's okay to experience those other emotions. They're not, they're not bad. They're uncomfortable, but they're not bad. Absolutely. The, the reason we focus on having a daily dose of happy is because we know that when we're in that happy place, that's when we do our best attracting. But that that's a far statement from saying, oh, you should only feel happy. That That's crazy. Life is Yeah, and I know we don't emotions. say that. And, that's and we don't, no. But I have heard it from some places. And so I'll always, you know, I'm the one that's always making that statement. But I, I guess it's because I feel it's important that that we continue to be sure and make that known is as much as we want you to be happy as much as you possibly can. And we want to contribute to that as much as we possibly can. And we're never going to stand in a place where we say other emotions are wrong or bad. Right. And and you've actually said it beautifully in the past that 
emotions of any kind are neither good or bad. It's re- good and bad really don't apply. They are, yeah. they are what you have. They're, they're what you're yeah, feeling. They feel good, and sometimes they feel bad, but I don't like to categorically label any emotion as being you know, wrong. I think that's exactly. what happens is it, it not only gets translated as good and bad, but then it gets pushed into the right and wrong area. And mm-hmm. sometimes, I mean, I've had people tell me that they were really kind of beat themselves up mentally because they're feeling certain things. And it's like, you know, I don't want to feel that because it's bad and, and they're make they're making it wrong. And then in turn, when we make ourselves wrong, you know, that is just a, a road we don't want to go down. So, yeah. So I just think it was important to bring up mm-hmm. um, because it's, it's kind of been a hell of a week. <laughs> it has, it has. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and whenever uh, we go through, what uh, I, I like the the phrase that Tom Wells uses. I know he didn't originate it, but he uses it uh, fairly frequently. Going through your dark night of the soul. Any time yeah. anybody goes through a dark night of the soul is a time where you know where you want to get to. You do want to get back to that happy place, but you have to kind of go through where you are right now, and and until we're willing to recognize what we're feeling right now and to kind of get to the root of it and and. They'll pick it up and play with it and, and fold it in their hands and take it apart, see what's there and, and acknowledge it and and say, you know, it's okay. And and then eventually be able to let go of it because we don't want to live in that state forever. We just want to acknowledge that it's there so that we can release it. And then once we can wow. release it, then we start moving up. But you have to you have to go through the process sometimes. You know, what's interesting is when, when I was listening to you say what you just said, which was so powerful. It reminded me of when we talked about um, using what I call the magic trick for physical pain. Oh, right. Right. It's like you were like, pick it up, hold it, play with it, examine it, acknowledge it, talk about what it feels like, like all of that. And you know, that, that trick usually alleviates physical pain or at least reduces it greatly. And I think in my experience, this is the quickest way to process those really uncomfortable feelings and emotions Mm -hmm. that is to let them, let them have, let them exist, let them be, acknowledge them, validate them, you know, understand them. And, and then they can, we can pass through them or they can pass through up us. I think it's sort of a little bit of each, but you're right there. We do have to go through that place to get to the other side. And so when we hold ourselves back from it and we suppress it and we don't, acknowledge it it's really hard to make the progress to get to the other side yeah that's when we end up living in it (laughs) the the healing is right is where is where the the solutions come um instead of just the pain so i think it's really important to notice too that if we don't go through it because you just pointed out it's possible to bury it to kind of you know i'm not going to deal with it that kind of thing that's when we end up living with it I think it's really important to recognize that the, the, when when we find ourselves constantly in a in some negative state, it's because we're not allowing ourselves to get through it. So we live with it. We we basically have put it aside so we can live with it, which is not the way we think about it. But that's what we end up doing, which is really wild. <laughs> oh, it's a really it's a good point. I mean, there's a whole conversation around this, especially in some coaching circles, about the idea of spiritual bypassing mm. and. You know, which is just, I'm going to use these spiritual tools. I'm going to make everything spiritual and use these spiritual tools so I don't have to deal with all that. And I was asked about this recently because a lot of it comes up in law of attraction circles just because of the nature of the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. So it comes up the same way. And I addressed it just saying, look, I know what this is about because I was in a really terrible marriage and I decided I would just do that exact thing. Mm. I would meditate. I would stay happy. I would, and I would ignore the things that were going on that were so awful. And what I I was doing exactly what you just said, I was just pushing the awfulness over there so I could live with it. Mm. And then pretending that everything was, was perfect. And it wasn't, it was far from it. And I had to, you know, be willing to acknowledge what was actually happening. And then when I did, you know, then I had the ability to change things and to, and my life shifted dramatically. And so, yeah, I think it's really important 
to not look the other way about things, whether they're in your own personal life, which I have a big deal of a great deal of experience with <laughs> in the past. Um, I mean, I don't now, but it's how I learned the lesson. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, oh, yeah. it's how I learned. And so, yeah, whether it's personal or whether it's on a bigger scale, like a national scale, I think it's important to, to know that all your feelings are valid. They're important. They're telling you what you value, what you care about. And, um, and it's, it's all fine and, and good and well, and we should be more comfortable with talking about things that don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And especially when it's something like this, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. so okay, I won't dwell there. But... Well, I actually wanted to mention one other thing. The, I remember this one phrase you used very clearly when you first explained the magic trick here on the podcast, the one where you help somebody just kind of work their way through whatever the physical pain is and it, it alleviates itself. And that was where the, the question that you asked was, if it held water, how much water would it hold? And I always loved that one because <laughs> it, it, it has a, a nice metaphorical quality to it. You know, does it really hold water, this thing that right. you're holding on to? Yeah. And there's so many things that really don't hold water, but we try to keep the water in anyway. <laughs> That's, really, that's so true. <laughs> we struggle yeah. to keep that water in there. <laughs> I love that. That was great. So, that's true. so, so I woke up this morning and I did see something that put a big smile on my face, and that was that I saw a picture of these people in, I think it was Portland, Oregon. Mm. Um, these women, there were hundreds of them. They're all dressed up in the very cla classic witch costume with the tall, pointy black hat. Oh and yeah. The black clothes and they're going down the river i guess is it the willamette river um on paddle boards <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, hundreds of them and when you see the picture of it you just can't help but think oh my goodness <laughs> it was really awesome for halloween i thought it was great <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> so right it, it is a it is a funny thing to uh to see so that brought a smile to my face this morning which uh, I'm, I'm grateful for. Not surprisingly, of course, what we're really talking about is feeling your way through whatever it is that you're feeling. And yeah. that ties in, of course, as usual, directly with our new project here on LOA Today, because you and I are going to be looking at yet another Neville Goddard book. And it's very appropriately named Feeling is the Secret. And I, I'm just wondering, did you pick that title because what we're talking about or did that come to you in another way? Because it's so appropriate. I did not. It's so funny that you just said it. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is perfect. Um, No, yesterday I, I picked up my collection and just started looking through the, the titles I have of Neville's work. Mm -hmm. uh, we had finished the last one and I thought what would be a good one to do and my eyes just lit on that particular uh, one, and I thought it would be great. It's a good one. It's important. Um, feeling is the secret. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I've got the paperback in front of me. I know we're using, um, we found Neville's work on a website. Uh, this one is feelingisthesecret.org. So if you're listening and you actually want to read on, on the screen and follow us a little bit, you can. Um, but in my in my hard copy version, there are two quotes before the foreword to the book. Okay. And I thought that they were really interesting when taken together. Um, Let's hear them. So I want to ask you now before we go any further, because I'm not sure where you want to do promos today. Oh, if good you, point. Yes. Before I, we get into it. Yeah, we should probably get the promos done so we can just dive right in, shouldn't we? So, yes, first promo, as we all know, is we want people who are not yet subscribers to become subscribers. And it's really easy to do. If you aren't sure how to do it, just go to the homepage of our website at loatoday.net. The instructions are right there. You've got links to click that'll just walk you right through the process. And just like that, bada bing, bada boom, you're a subscriber. And that way you get all the good episodes that we do 11 every week coming right to your phone when you can listen to them every time you want to anytime you want to you can even binge listen we have binge listeners and i still love that part i mean i, I had never even heard the term binge listener until we started doing a podcast but once i heard that i said i like that term that's a good term <laughs> so thank you to all the binge listeners and for all of our existing subscribers and for the new subscribers please continue to put out there on social media that you're listening to loatoday.net because that helps spread the word and we want more and more people to get their deal 
daily dose of happy. So we're going to do the condensed versions of the promos. There's the condensed version, Cindy. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Well, I wanted to mention these two quotes at the beginning of this book. For me personally, they were kind of interesting. The first one is uh, from the book of Ecclesiastes, which is interesting because that also is the, the book um, in the Torah that talks about um, there is a time, right? <laughs> there is a time and a season, a time to mourn and a time for joy. Mm-hmm. But this particular verse says, of making many books, there is no end. Of, and see, I'm a book lover. So when I saw this, ah. of making <laughs> of making many books, there is no end. And then the next quote just says it's an old saying. It doesn't say where it comes from. Mm. It says, he that would perfect himself in any art whatsoever, let him betake himself to the reading of some sure and certain work upon his art many times over or to read many books upon your art produces confusion rather than learning. Hmm. And I thought this was really interesting and it will become more relevant to what we're talking about with Neville. But, you know, it's like the idea of what we've been talking about from the, from the other Neville book, um, where we create a scene <laughs> that sounds so funny, right? Don't make a scene. <laughs> um, if you're not familiar with our past programs, we're talking about sort of, I like to say, writing a very short screenplay of a few sentences or just a little scene in our mind. Cause we're talking about imagining a small vignette, a small little scene that would be the result of us getting what we wanted. Mm. And what I thought was interesting is that, the idea we talked about with that is not to keep constructing all these different scenes about what, what it would be like, but to construct one scene and sort of play it over and over in our imagination mm-hmm. until it feels solid Yeah. for days or weeks or months or however long it takes until, as Neville says, it starts to harden into reality. Mm-hmm. And so when I read this about, he that would perfect himself in any art whatsoever, let him betake himself to the reading of some sure and certain work upon his art many times over for to read many books upon your art produces confusion. And I thought that reminded me of that idea, right? It's just like, no, just over and over focus on what it is that you want instead of going off in every direction. <laughs> Which we're prone to do. I know I do it frequently and and I have actually been recognizing lately that I need to be a little bit more specific a little bit more focused than that and and stick literally to what it is i want to focus on which is not always easy to do but it's certainly a big and important goal well i think that it's one of the reasons i know you asked me earlier in the week about meditation Mm -hmm. and it's one of the things that meditation does for us it helps us have a clearer head it helps us be able to focus in a clearer way because we have a lot of information coming at us all the time Mm mm-hmm very true. Right? I mean, from all different places and, you know, social media, computers, phones, televisions, whatever, podcasts, <laughs> <laughs> uh, people, you know, our jobs, whatever. We've got so much stuff coming in all the time. And so it's no wonder that sometimes it's hard for us to suddenly just laser focus in on one thing. But it takes practice. And I thought those quotes were interesting in that way. I'm glad that you mentioned meditation, by the way, because I, we we haven't been promoting it, but we got to promote the fact that tomorrow afternoon in tomorrow afternoon's podcast, you're going to be leading our audience in a guided meditation. We need to, to say, hey, by the way, you want to tune in? This is going to be a good one. Yeah, I'm excited about that. You know, it's so funny, synchronicities that happen. Um, we had talked about doing it and then set it up to do uh, the live guided meditation and then literally... In an hour or so, I got an email from somebody that um, occasionally I'm hired to write meditations for some of the companies that put out meditations. Mm, okay. And, and um, I haven't done it in quite a while. And I get this email. It's like, hey, I haven't reached out to you in a long time, but I'm wondering if you are still interested in writing meditations uh for a company, you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, that's funny. <laughs> We're just talking about it. It's just like all starts coming in wherever you point that focus. So, Law of attraction is an amazing thing. It continues to amaze us even though we know exactly what it is. Right. <laughs> right? Right, right. So, okay, so we'll start with the foreword. It's short. Uh, this book, and the book is called Feeling is the Secret, Neville Goddard. 
Um, this book is concerned with the art of realizing your desire. It gives you an account of the mechanism used in the production of the visible world. It is a small book, but not slight. There is a treasure in it, a clearly defined road to the realization of your dreams. Were it possible to carry conviction to another by means of reasoned arguments and detailed instances, this book would be many times its size. It is seldom possible, however, to do so by means of written statements or arguments, since to the suspended judgment it always seems plausible to say that the author was dishonest or deluded and therefore his evidence was tainted. Consequently, I've purposely omitted all arguments and testimonials and simply challenged the open-minded reader to practice the law of consciousness as revealed in this book. Personal success will prove far more convincing than all the books that could be written on the subject. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Is there anything more convincing than experiencing something? No. No, really not isn't. at all. No. I mean, yeah. So we start with chapter one, which is called Law and Its Operation. The world and all within it is man's conditioned consciousness objectified. Consciousness is the cause as well as the substance of the entire world. So it is to consciousness that we must turn if we would discover the secret of creation. Knowledge of the law of consciousness and the method of operating this law will enable you to accomplish all you desire in life. Armed with a working knowledge of this law, you can build and maintain an ideal world. Consciousness is the one and only reality. Not figuratively, but actually. The reality may, for the sake of clarity, be likened unto a stream which is divided into two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. In order to intelligently operate the law of consciousness, it is necessary to understand the relationship between the conscious and the subconscious. The conscious is personal and selective. The subconscious is impersonal and non-selective. The conscious is the realm of effect. The subconscious is the realm of cause. These two aspects are the male and female divisions of consciousness. The conscious is male. The subconscious is female. I, I got to stop right there. And the reason I want to stop is it, this is expressed quite differently from the way Abraham talks about consciousness. And specifically about how they talk about subconsciousness. Mm -hmm. Because yes. Abra Abraham very specifically dismisses most of the theories about the subconscious and says, it's all conscious. <laughs> you may have forgotten about it, but it's all conscious. Yeah. And they, they also say that if, if it mattered, um, you know, you would all, you would notice it because it's subconscious. It's beneath the level where you'll notice. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. the thing that I would bring up there is the idea of dreams. Our dreams I believe dreams are the subconscious made conscious. At the point that we have the dream and remember it, it's conscious now. Right? <laughs> Except when I don't remember the dream. <laughs> well, there's a great deal of, you know, of research done on dreaming and dreams. And I'm starting to find a lot of it connected to the law of attraction that when we acknowledge our dreams, when we begin to make a habit of remembering our dreams by keeping a dream journal, by letting our, you know, mind know that it's important, um, then our dream life can actually be really, really effective in supporting our law of attraction practice. So when I see this about conscious and subconscious, uh, that's what comes up for me, that our subconscious, you know, it's like when people re recognize that they have a pattern in their life, in their behavior. You know, at some point, I think 
when they recognize it, it's now become conscious, but it wasn't before. Mm -hmm. True. Um, so our conscious and subconscious, I don't know what Neville's going to say <laughs> moving forward here, um, cause I'm not, um, I have read this book, but it's been a long time. So I'm happy to go back and read it again. And I'm, I'm expecting that we're going to find out how fluid and it's funny, he used like the idea of a stream. So water, right, right. um, how fluid our subconscious and conscious can be. I mean, I think these things come into our consciousness. So how would that be different from what Abraham says? Well, I don't know how to tie that one together. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's probably more, more accurate to say that there's similarities. The similarities are that when you have uh, the, the Abraham concept that the subconscious mind and subconscious thoughts are simply conscious thoughts that we've forgotten about or just kind of mm. uh, left behind or whatever, and ex explain it in those terms, then it makes much more sense what you're saying that, you know, we, we don't have to necessarily think of the subconscious mind as if it were some sort of a separate thing. It's just another aspect of ourselves. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even when we suddenly remember something, right? It's like, it comes, it seems to come out of nowhere. <laughs> right. And I don't even mean like remembering a dream, although that's a really good example, right? Sometimes, I mean, I know for me, sometimes I'll be awake for a little while and all of a sudden remember a dream. But I've also remembered a dream late, way later in the day, uh, in the middle of the afternoon or evening. And all of a sudden said, oh, my goodness, I just remembered this dream that I had, <laughs> you know, like the night before or whatever. Well. What about when we remember something else? It's like, oh, oh, I just remembered I was intending to do, you know, X, Y, Z. Well, where was that memory before it came to the surface and you recognized it? Mm. It was somewhere, right? Right. I think that's subconscious. I think it is too. I mean, that, that what it really comes down to is if it's not something that you're currently aware of in your, in your active mind, we call it subconscious. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's going on here. You're, you're, you're talking about how something came to mind. It became to your awareness. And in that way, it became conscious. Uh, but as Abraham points out, the conscious mind created that in the first place. The, the conscious mind was, was already doing that. It just kind of left it behind and forgot about it. So it, really, there's not a, any conflict between Neville's way of expressing it and Abraham's way of expressing it. It's just that they're so different, it seems like there would be. But I don't think there really yeah. is one. We'll have to see. We may find a big conflict moving forward, um, <laughs> okay. which is, is fine with me. Like I'm very open to different ideas. I don't have, I don't, um, I don't consider, uh, Abraham Hicks to be etched in stone. No. Um, it is, it is a teaching that I've found a lot of value in. Um, but I'm totally open to other perspectives. So we'll see what he says. And the thought came to me when you were saying that. I thought, what if we, what if we keep going and we realize that these words mean something completely different than what we define them as meaning anyway, right? You know, kind well, of Well, that's like true. Neville. We haven't put the Neville decoder <laughs> ring on yet. And once we do that, we find all, all kinds of new things that we didn't recognize before. So, that, yeah, you're right. That could definitely happen. <laughs> okay. So he says the conscious is male. The subconscious is female. Uh, the conscious generates ideas. And impresses these ideas on the subconscious. By the way, do you think that's true about his, his gender associations there? Conscious male, subconscious female? Well, I mean, I like to think of the idea of, um, do you ever work with electricity? Yeah, all day long. I sit at a computer. Right. So you've got I have lamps tables on, and I mean, cords and you've got a female oh, yeah. and a male. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we use these terms a lot for different things mm -hmm. than other than like human gender or sexuality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I actually, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I see where he's going to go with this because where I think he's going to go is to conception and bringing something forth, manifestation, birth, you know, planting a seed. I, I mean, I'm just knowing Neville. I think that's where he's going. <laughs> um, but as far as what's interesting, what I think is interesting when I read this part that says, um, the conscious generates ideas and impresses these ideas on the subconscious. The subconscious receives ideas. See, there you have the, 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 the male, female, female thing. right? The yeah. receiver. Um, and gives form and expression to them. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of 
decades about um, male energy and female energy. And it sounds a lot like this. Um, there's kind of been a, a resurgence of that whole idea. And so we'll see if, if he aligns with that or not. But mm. um, he says, by this law, first conceiving an idea <laughs> and then impressing the idea conceived on the subconscious, all things evolve out of consciousness. And without this sequence, there's not anything made that is made. The conscious impresses the subconscious while the subconscious expresses all that is impressed upon it. So here we have what you said before that Abraham says, well, our conscious mind is what's creating everything. Mm -hmm. But what Neville's saying is that it's our consciousness that impresses the subconscious, which is actually doing the creating. Uh, The subconscious does not originate ideas, but accepts as true those which the conscious mind feels to be true in a way known only to itself objectifies the accepted ideas. I will say that um, I have heard this idea before about our subconscious not um, making judgments, so to speak. Like, it's sort of like been likened to a computer. It's like whatever you program it to do, it just does that. Which is why when people talk about like affirmations, or probably a better word to use would be those old stories. And hypnosis works that way. So, right, if I'm always saying some story about myself, like I'm terrible at remembering names. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm terrible at remembering names. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm telling that story all the time, that the, the way I've heard it explained is that my subconscious just says, okay, My subconscious doesn't object. My subconscious doesn't say, oh, no, that's a bad idea. Don't tell that story. (laughs) (laughs) That's my conscious. (laughs) Right? My subconscious just obeys the order. Okay. Hey, you want to be bad at names? We'll be bad at names. I Mm. can do that. Um, I think for myself, I've often wondered what it meant to say the word subconscious. What is a subconscious? I mean, conscious, I I can kind of loosely associate that with identity and who I am. Okay, that makes some sense to me, and it, and it's me in my right. alert now state. That's fine. So, what is subconscious? And that's where the definition gets a little bit slipperier, and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. Yeah, and then Florence Scovel Shin talks about the supraconscious. Yeah, we won't we won't go there yet. But so the thing I think is interesting though is even in that example of of the conscious and subconscious, it really is sort of the conscious mind that's that is originating the idea i mean it may have come from somewhere else but right but but not the subconscious the conscious mind tells the story about Mm ourselves and then the subconscious just makes it happen it's almost like the subconscious is a database that we store the information in so i can totally get where it says you know the subconscious does not originate ideas but accepts as true those which the conscious mind feels to be true Mm -hmm. And in a way known only to itself, objectifies the accepted ideas. Mm. Okay, Therefore, well, let's keep going then. Through his power to imagine and feel, and his freedom to choose the idea he will entertain, man has control over creation. Control of the subconscious is accomplished through control of your ideas and feelings. The mechanism of creation is hidden in the very depths of the subconscious, the female aspect or womb of creation. The subconscious transcends reason and is independent of induction. It contemplates a feeling as a fact existing within itself and on this assumption proceeds to give expression to it. The creative process begins with an idea and its cycle runs its course as a feeling and ends in a volition to act. Now, what's interesting about that sentence to me um, is subconscious transcends reason and is independent of induction. It contemplates a feeling as a fact existing within itself. You know, there's been proof um, that when we feel something, our body 
or or our brain um but i'm speaking of body chemistry and like you know neural function doesn't really differentiate between if it's really happening or not right Mm -hmm. i mean what what comes to mind is one of those things where they have them at some different amusement parks or whatever where it's like a big screen like an imax screen and it's you're watching a screen of like a roller coaster ride and your body feels like you're rushing down the roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Really just sitting in the chair. So I think it's interesting to see that here that it, it contemplates a feeling as a fact. So of course, that's what this whole book is about, right? Feeling. Ideas are impressed on the subconscious through the medium of feeling. But let's also touch on another word he used, induction. Induction to induce something. And Mm -hmm. and what was the exact uh, phrase? Where is it? He says the subconscious transcends reason and is independent of induction. What do you think he means by that? What independent of inducing stuff? What does that mean? Well, I think that he's saying that the first section transcends reason is is reminds me of what we just talked about, right? Like, um, it doesn't it doesn't say, oh no, don't don't make that statement that you're bad at names. That's not good, mm-hmm. right? That's the logical mind. The logical right. mind would say, yeah, don't do that. You want to be good at names. <laughs> don't right, keep right. telling that story. <laughs> um, so there's no logic or reason to that. It just accepts it. The subconscious accepts that story or that feeling. And it's independent of induction. So it's working on its own uh, with whatever we're giving it. That's the way I take it. Okay. How does that hit you when you read it? I'm not really sure. I mean, to induce is certainly a conscious activity. So I can understand that in that sense, the subconscious, which is more of a receiver of uh, the, 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 the metaphor that seems to be working best for me is the database. The subconscious is the database that we store stuff in. It isn't where active thought is going on. It's where subactive mm. thought or something. I don't know how else to describe that. Um, right. And so in that sense, I can, I can understand how it is independent of induction. And yet so much of what we talk about where sub- subconscious mind and subconscious impulses are involved are talking about how the subconscious mind induces us to do things. And yet he's pointing out that there's no induction going on. So I'm but not that's quite... the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure how to make sense out of what the subconscious mind is in that way. I mean, it does. Yes, I get it. It's the other way around. So what is the role of the subconscious mind? I guess I go back to being a receptacle to store stuff in. Well, it also, it also is apparently creating. And. Is it? And if it is, how is that different from a conscious um, function? I don't think that it's the subconscious that we induce, but the conscious. In other words, it's kind of like, I don't know, it reminds me of when we say, don't worry about the how. We're, we're more concerned with the feelings and the imagination, not with the how. And he even says this at the very beginning, um, although I feel like we're still at the very beginning, but he says, um, let's see. He talks about, you know, in a, in a way all its own or something like that. You know, the, the sentence I'm speaking of, he talks about the subconscious, how it, it has its own way of creating. So, and that, let's see. Hmm. Well, I can't find the one little sentence I'm looking for, of course. Um, (laughs) But if it begins, if the creative process begins with an idea, and its cycle runs its course as a feeling and ends in a volition to act. It's just what you said. It's the induction is going the other way. The subconscious is inducing us to act. We're not inducing the subconscious to do anything. It's independent of induction. So the subconscious is, is, is a stimulus, but it's not a cause. That's the way I would read that. In other words, the subconscious isn't causing things to happen. It's it's stimulating them. It's stimulating them just by here's here's some memories, here's some stuff, here's some stuff. 
but it's not causing in the sense of, I am going to induce you right now to start feeling this <laughs> terrible thing that you experienced when you were five. That's not what's going on there. It's just, it's here. There's, here's this thing that you experienced when you were five. That's all. You know, you feel it or not, or do what you want with it, but I'm just saying it's here. So that's when it becomes conscious. Yeah. So let's keep going because sometimes we'll get clearer as we keep, keep going and see what he has to say. Yep. Um, I want to make sure I know where I'm going here. Uh, ideas are impressed on the subconscious through the medium of feeling. No idea can be impressed on the subconscious until it is felt. But once felt, be it good, bad, or indifferent, it must be expressed. Feeling is the one and only medium through which ideas are conveyed to the subconscious. Therefore, the man who does not control his feeling may easily impress the subconscious with undesirable states. By control of feeling is not meant restraint or suppression of your feeling. Thank you, Neville. <laughs> <laughs> but rather the disciplining of self to imagine and entertain only such feeling as contributes to your happiness. Control of your feeling is all important to a full and happy life. And when he says control, I am interp I'm I'm putting on the, the decoder ring and I'm changing that to selecting. Well, what's interesting to me is, you know, he says I'm not talking about restraining or suppressing suppression of your feeling, but rather the disciplining of self to imagine and entertain only such feeling as contributes to your happiness. Control of your feeling is all important to a full and happy life and I always look at the other side of that and think a lot of times it's the feelings that we are uncomfortable with that are out of control. Mm -hmm. Like we don't acknowledge them in a way that's healthy. Mm -hmm. We don't um, learn an appropriate way to process like anger per se. And so those things aren't controlled at all. And it's an important, you know, skill to have. <laughs> it's important acknowledgement um, that we're all going to feel all kinds of things and learning to appropri appropriately express them. And, you know. I, and I think that's consistent with what I was saying about selecting. I, I think that yeah. if you have, oh, a, yeah. if you have a, a feeling that, that that's haunting you, that's, you know, it just doesn't seem to want to go away. You have to kind of select it. And say, okay, I select that I'm going to examine you now. I just not, yeah, I may have been avoiding you up until now, but I select that I'm going to examine you now. I choose you. So let's look at you for a bit and let's see how much water you actually hold. <laughs> yeah. So here's your question. Right. Well, he, he says here, now this is interesting to me. Never entertain an undesirable feeling, nor think sympathetically about wrong in any shape or form. And when I read that, one of the things that I recognize is that word undesirable. Um, there are certain things that, you know, we may not desire. But I think that it's not about entertaining it. It's just about recognizing it. Yeah. So I want I want to be clear about what I think he's saying here. He's not saying to never feel an undesired feeling. Right. It, there, there's a saying that I love that I heard years and years ago. And it, it says, and it's, 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 it's appropriate because we're talking about thoughts, right? Law of attraction is about thoughts creating things. But the idea is that um, it's okay to let a bird fly over your head, but you don't have to let it make its nest in your hair. <laughs> yep. And so, you know, is it a desirable thing to feel grief? It actually is um, because there's a process involved that we need to work through, right? Is it desirable to feel anger? It's not really the feeling I want to feel, um, but it can be useful to find solutions if I know how to deal with it appropriately. So I don't want to entertain it on end. And I don't want to call it to myself, <laughs> but, you know, 
I like this part. I, I, this I, sus I suspect that the word entertain is a very s deliberately chosen word by Neville, where it says never I entertain so a desirable feeling. Like it would, it's like entertaining guests. You bring guests over to your house and you entertain yes. them and, and, and you're, you're trying to find ways to please them. And, and would you like to have some, something to eat? Can I get you something to drink? And, you know, how was your day and what you've been doing, what you've been up to lately? Tell me about what's going on in your life and so forth. That's entertaining. It's like, I, I want you to be here. So I'm going to do everything I can to make you feel welcome here, which is not what we're saying to do about a, a, a negative emotion. It's not like you want to say, oh, pull up a chair, you know, make yourself at home. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't want it to unpack and move in. That's yeah. right. So he says, nor think sympathetically about wrong in any shape or form. Do not dwell on the imperfection of yourself or others. To do so is to impress the subconscious with these limitations. What you do not want done unto you, do not feel that it is done unto you or another. That's an interesting sentence. He goes on to say, this is the whole law of a full and happy life. Everything else is commentary. Um, what you do not want done unto you, do not feel that it is done unto you or another. And I see that that's a really important thing when sometimes we feel like we've been wronged. And what, what I see there is victim energy. Hmm. Because yeah. when we're, and we've all been there, um, but, and when we're in that space, um, it's very hard to see out of it. Mm, very hard. And what is the feeling that we have when we're there? We, we go, we can go on and on sometimes feeling that some wrong was done to us. And that doesn't mean that, you know, that sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, when it, when it does, it's important to process the emotions that come with it. But not to entertain that. Yeah. I mean, I've actually had people say to me before, nothing ever works out for me. Mm. And that's entertaining. I've said it. I, I've said it myself. I mean, right? I can think of times I've said that. Yeah. And, and regretted so, it afterward. <laughs> <laughs> Every feeling makes a subconscious impression. And unless it's counteracted by a more powerful feeling of an opposite nature, must be expressed. The dominant of two feelings is the one expressed. I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. To feel I will be is to confess I am not. I am, I am is stronger than I am not. So we've talked about I am stories. Mm -hmm. I actually had someone reach out to me that had heard us talking about I am stories and, and wanted help with changing their I am story. And, and I, I told them to start out by just making the intention to open your awareness to whatever stories you're already telling. Yes. Like that's where you start. You just start to pay attention to what you're saying. And, you know, sometimes it's small things and sometimes it's things that have more weight. Mm -hmm. um, nothing ever works out for me is a pretty is a pretty weighty statement. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if someone's saying, I'm always being taken advantage of, it also I'm always me late. Too. I'm always late for everything. I'm never yeah. on time. You know, I mean, I've heard people say these stories, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, We've all done it. And, We've all said stuff like so, that. So he says that I am is stronger than I am not. Mm -hmm. Which is true. And I have, I've actually asked that question before about people that, you know, we get focused on our I am stories. What about our I am not stories? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are there too. I think it's also um, important to mention too, there's not, there's nothing actually wrong with saying that I will be healthy rather than I am healthy. There are times when I will be healthy is a better feeling place than where you're at. So it's good to go there because I am healthy seems too far away. But right, and that, I think he he's not saying that either one is wrong. He just yeah. says one is stronger than he the other. He says one is stronger, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's an important and thing I, to remember. I, I also like to use the. That's why I like to use the two phrases that I really like. Um, I am learning, and I'm in the process. 
like I'm in the process of becoming healthier. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to be healthy. I'm learning about things that are healthier for me. Right. Um, so he says what you, I, I like this though. The dominant of two feelings is the one expressed. Mm. Um, what you feel you are always dominate, what you feel you are always dominates what you feel you would like to be. Therefore, to be realized, the wish must be felt as a state that is, that is, rather than a state that is not. Now, this is, this goes back to what Abraham was saying about two ends of the same stick, right? Mm -hmm. Or two sides of the same coin. Sometimes we talk about a certain thing and we're actually focusing on the lack of it. And that's what I see here. Yeah. Is that what you feel you are always dominates what you feel you would like to be. Exactly. That, that's the difference between the dominant feeling and the stronger feeling. Because the dominant feeling can actually be worse. It could be a worse feeling. But it could be also the, the dominant feeling, whereas the stronger feeling is the one that feels better. And that, right. that, 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 yes. that that's an interesting distinction right there, but it's a valid yes. one. Very good catch. Yep. So he says the wish, and I don't know if he... He has used the word wish yet in this particular book. Um, when you begin to read Neville, you will notice something that he talks about a lot, and that is a direction to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled, mm -hmm. meaning whatever you're wishing for, you need to learn how to feel what it would feel like once that wish is already fulfilled and feel that, <laughs> yeah. right? It's a difference between faith and hope. Because faith is a knowing kind of feeling that it's, it is what it is. You are that. Hoping is off in the future. I'm not that yet. And I've been very cognizant lately of, of trying to remember, okay, yes, right now I want to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. What does that feel like? And, and that's where the challenge always is. Like finding what does it feel like. The vignette approach has helped quite a bit. Um, trying to, to imagine one little vignette of here is one thing that happens immediately after my wish gets fulfilled. And that, that, that's a helpful thing. Uh, I still find at times that I'm not quite sure what, what, where to find the feeling, so to speak, or, or what mm -hmm. it looks like or what it tastes like or how much water it holds or, right. or any of that stuff. <laughs> um, but that, that's it. That's, that's the, the exercise. And, and that's where the real work is, is finding that feeling even in the midst of not having it or well, especially something's interesting too. Having. And I don't know, you know, if Neville really makes the distinction. So I'm not saying that this is what he is meaning when he uses the word feeling, but you know, we have feelings and we have emotions and mm -hmm. sometimes those words get interchanged, but they they're do. actually different. Mm. Right. Because emotions, happy, sad, scared, angry, but feelings, can be literally like we were talking about one of the vignettes that Neville suggested was walking up a flight of stairs. And we laughed about it. Remember? Cause we were mm -hmm. like, well, what, how would that be the natural result of something? And we're like, well, <laughs> so we made a story. We're like, well, what if you wanted to live in a certain apartment and it happened to yeah. be upstairs and your wish was that it would come open and you would get to move there. That may be the exact thing you do upon the manager handing you the key to your new place. You walk up the stairs. Well, besides feeling joyful and elated and thrilled that you have this apartment you've been wanting, what about the actual physical feeling in your body of your feet hitting the stairs as you walk up, of your hand touching the handrail? Because mm. he talks about imagining a friend in front of you that's congratulating you for a promotion that you right. were wishing for. And you reach out and you shake his hand and you feel your friend's hand in your hand. So his feelings that he's talking about sometimes, at least sometimes, are actual physical feelings. Mm, and that's a good point. That's a really important point uh, because I've been using the uh, the motif of being congratulated as one of my you know go to vignettes. When I'm not sure what else to go to, I'll go to that one. And you're right; it, I, it's a lot easier in many of those situations to just imagine the physical sensation of what happens in a congratulatory stance. But that's necessarily so easy to remember what the emotion is that you feel or, or to feel that emotion. So you're right. You can, we can start with what does it actually feel like? 
What does it feel like to shake the hand? What does it feel like to be on the phone with somebody? What does it feel like to be doing like a an online video thing? What does it feel like to to be doing some kind of interaction? You're, you're touching the mouse. You're you're touching the keyboard. You're shaking the hand. You're, you're doing the. You can feel those things if you really reach out for those, and they don't necessarily have to have an emotional component that just kind of jumps right out at you. Right. Like I was thinking about the the story about the young woman who wanted who was blind and wanted a driver. Mm-hmm. And what was she feeling? Well, she was feeling her feet on the floorboard of the car. She was feeling the rumble of the car as it vibrated down the road. You know, she was also hearing the sounds she would hear in the city. And I think those are more accessible to us sometimes than emotional, you know, than emotions, like trying to work up an emotion, right? It's good to remember that they're valid. They're, that it's actually a valid kind of feeling because because we, we tend to think about the emotions being the valid ones. But a feeling is a feeling, right? regardless of whether it's emotional or not. It's valid. Yeah. So I I like that uh, way of of processing this, and I noticed that in my own since we've been doing Neville for the last couple of weeks, I've been using the same method, and I have one little vignette that I've been going over and over. And those things, like I told you, I realized at one point that like my feet were on the ground and I noticed the shoes that I had on. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I've noticed, you know, that I'm sitting and I can feel myself sitting in the chair. My feet are firmly on the floor. Like those were not things that I was conscious of when I first started, Mm. which is maybe, I don't know, a week, 10 Mm -hmm. days, maybe. Mm hmm. Um, and now all of a sudden when I'm, when I'm going through this little vignette in my mind, I'm, I am feeling it in my body. I'm feeling myself sitting in the chair. I'm feeling my hand on a table. I'm feeling my feet on the floor. It's like, and those aren't emotions. Now, what usually happens is it's about 60 seconds for me to work my way through the little scene I've created. And I usually end up with a big smile on my face. <laughs> um, and so that, there's definitely some emotion that that's taking place. But the first things that I've been aware of have been actual feelings, not emotions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And it beca- and, you know, Neville talks about the scene that we've created about imagining it until it hardens into fact. And I think that's an interesting turn of phrase because when we're talking about feeling something, like you said, I can feel my hand on the mouse. I'm clicking the keys. I can, you know, right. It's like, it's hard. It's like, I can understand that that is it beginning to harden into fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's really the art right there is trying to, to turn as many of the elements of the many feeling elements of a, of a scene into fact in our minds. Cause the more that we can do that, the better we end up, you know, producing whatever it is that we want, which is uh, that's something I'd like us to explore a little bit more um, with tomorrow's episode when we when we continue working on this chapter. The the idea of how it turns into a fact and and the different things that we can focus on in order to make stuff turn into fact in our minds, which actually is what turns it into fact in reality as well. Well, I know we're going to get there because. He, he's he's headed there now, so we'll be ready for the morning. <laughs> no, that's not, I'm, well, I'm ready for the morning right now, even though it's I know, morning I here. You know. going, right? <laughs> but we'll have to be a little bit patient and just wait for tomorrow. This is one of the few times when it's okay to be patient. <laughs> Abraham counsels, don't don't always uh, be patient, but this is a good time to be patient. So, uh, yeah, before we leave, too, let's also remind people how they can reach out to Cindy Chavez um, with her wonderful coaching abilities. How do they reach you, Cindy? They can find me online at cindychavez.com, C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z.com. I would love to hear from you. That sounds good. All right. Well, I'm looking forward already, as usual, with Neville. Neville's, you've got me hooked on Neville. I, I didn't have this hook <laughs> before, but you got me hooked on Neville. I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation about this feeling is the secret book tomorrow. Me too. All right. We hope that you'll join us as well tomorrow and every day here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.